Okay, uh, we're going to talk about how to make smart health choices based on what I call here seesaw physiology. What I mean by that is there's a lot of things in our life that are a question of balance and understanding what is the best thing to go for helps you to make wise health choices. First of all, the great seesaw, if you will, in our health is what you would call the, like the yin and yang of our health is sands and pans. SANS stands for Sympathetic Autonomic Nervous System. PANS stands for Parasympathetic Autonomic Nervous System. So SANS is basically being alert, attention. And at a maximal level, SANS would be like S for stress, the stress response. That would be maximum high level SANS, Sympathetic Autonomic Nervous System. PANS, this has been described as being like putting your foot on the brake. So SANS is putting your foot on the accelerator, PANS is putting your, your foot on the brake. Basically the human body has the ability to go into one or two of the, either of these modes. And PANS has been called rest and digest, you know, sleep and digest your food. Also feed and breed. So PANS indicates a time when you feel safe and comfortable and you can relax. And basically you, most people are overloaded with SANS and don't get enough time in PANS. So you want to try to make more time in your life to be just calm and relaxed, to get some sleep, to be doing things that are kind of pleasant. Um, and that, that is going to end up being important because excessive amounts of SANS really impairs your health. All right, so now SANS with a stress response, we've talked about this in other lectures, but it's associated with increased cortisol. All the stuff on this side is the stuff that uh, the average American tends to have too much of and it's harming their health. Cortisol is an unhealthy hormone. We talked about that quite a lot with lectures on caffeine and stress and whatnot. Um, oxytocin and melatonin are the healthy hormones that are the counterweights to cortisol. So oxytocin is the love and safety hormone. It's like when the child's with mama and papa and the child feels happy and safe to explore the environment. So the love hormone, melatonin is the sleep hormone produced by the pineal gland. So most of us need to calm down and get more sleep and be in a more loving environment to the extent that's possible. Um, and you can also, by understanding this, recognize your own self when you're drifting into too much of the negative stuff and try to get more of the positive stuff into your life. And as you develop improved self-awareness, you also then develop increased perception of what's happening with other persons. So self-awareness is the path to understanding other people better. Um, sodium, the average American eats far too much sodium compared to potassium and that's a big part of why they're hypertensive and sick. Our ancestors ate 10 times as much potassium as sodium whereas we, we tend to eat about 10 times as much sodium as potassium and this causes uh, vasoconstriction of arteries, impairs endothelial nitric oxide, the vasodilator and by constricting all the arteries that leads to uh, high blood pressure because the heart has to pump the blood through a narrowed circulatory system Okay, so you want more potassium. It's a vasodilator. Where does it come from? P for potassium, P for plants, of course. Okay, iron is something we tend to be overloaded on in this country because people tend to eat too much meat. Also, they got to be careful they're not getting too much iron from, uh, sometimes people are taking multivitamins that contain iron. It's a bad idea. You don't want to be taking iron unless you're really anemic and you're prescribed by your doctor that you need iron. Uh, the vast majority of Americans are overloaded in iron, especially men. Okay, women start becoming overloaded in iron quite typically once they're postmenopausal because they're no longer menstruating. They don't lose that iron every month. Um, what you really want, iron is a pro-oxidant. It causes oxidative stress. It causes oxidation and it can actually contribute in a very significant way to uh, cellular injury and to neurodegeneration, you know, Alzheimer's and uh, loss of cognitive function. Vitamin C is sort of the prototype antioxidant and there's other antioxidants. There's the carotenes, the glutathione and whatnot. But the bottom line, these come from plants. A person, if they're out in the sun, let's say it's 95 degrees outside, what do you do? You go walk in the shade, you go walk into a building with some air conditioning or whatnot. A plant can't do that. A plant has to stay out in the sun in a fixed position and its only way to prevent itself from being burned up and injured by the sun is that it produces chemicals that protect it. So the plant produces all sorts of antioxidants and when we eat the plants we get the antioxidants. We don't get them from eating meat because the animal itself has used them all up. Um, 
you really, like I said, we talked about this in other lectures, I recommend 100% plant-based. Uh, meat, there's, there's nothing that you need in meat to improve your health. There's a lot from plants. Plants is where it's at. Um, calcium and magnesium, very interesting. Excessive dietary calcium, excessive intracytoplasmic calcium, it tends to contribute to vasoconstriction of the smooth muscle cells in our arteries and it increases vasomotor tone causing high blood pressure. Now a lot of people are quite worried, especially women, about osteoporosis and it's very common to take calcium for that. My recommendation is be quite careful about that. Make sure you really need it because if you don't need it, you might be increasing your risk of high blood pressure, which goes with increased risk of atherosclerosis. Um, it's pretty easy to get adequate amount of calcium from your diet. Um, I'm just suggesting you, and by the way, I'm not involved in managing patients with calcium. I'm simply a physician who studied this topic, okay? It seems to me that a lot of people are becoming calcium overloaded and they're magnesium deficient. Magnesium comes from plant foods. If you look at a molecule of chlorophyll, magnesium is right in the center. Magnesium is a vasodilator. Magnesium is a nature's calcium channel blocker, it's been called. And that's because the magnesium, for example, sits right in the middle of the NMDA receptor in the brain, in the hippocampus. So glutamate is the main neurotransmitter of the brain. It's an excitatory neurotransmitter. It diffuses across the synaptic left in the hippocampus, which is the memory center of the brain. And it binds the postsynaptic receptor on the postsynaptic neuron. And within that neuron, the NMDA receptor for the glutamate, there is magnesium blocking the activity of glutamate. That is a good thing. That prevents overactivation of the postsynaptic neuron in the hippocampus. You want to protect your hippocampus. You want your hippocampus to be calmed down. Excessive activity in the hippocampus is a very common cause of neurodegeneration. I actually think it's the great secret of a tremendous amount of neurodegeneration that's making a lot of people uh, cognitively impaired. Okay, and so what am I saying is because Americans don't eat enough plants, the majority of them, the vast majority of them are magnesium deficient. They're deficient in antioxidants, they're deficient in potassium, and that is causing hypertension. That's causing excessive metabolic activity in their hippocampal neurons and leading to the death of many hippocampal neurons. Uh, leading to cognitive impairment. So what am I saying? You want more magnesium. Where are you going to get it? And more potassium. Where are you going to get it? Eat more plant foods. Eat less meat. Eat no meat, I'd recommend. Don't eat any processed food. Um, be very careful about supplementing with calcium and also taking oral vitamin D. You might be increasing your intestinal absorption of calcium um, more than you want. I would say, you know, to prevent osteoporosis, who gets osteoporosis? It happens in the countries where people drink a lot of milk, where they eat a lot of meat, in the more northern countries, all right? You don't have much of a problem with osteoporosis in countries that eat primarily plant-based diets. And why might that be? If you think about it, the amino acid composition in meat is different than it is in plants. The meat amino acids tend to have more methionine, more cysteine with more sulfur groups. In their met metabolism, part of that extra sulfur is made into sulfuric acid, causes a low-grade metabolic acidosis, calcium is leached from the bones, and that calcium is peed out through the kidneys. The calciuria excretion in the kidneys is coupled to excreting hydrogen protons, and therefore the pH can be improved to normal. Okay, so that's how um, leaching calcium from the bones serves as a pH buffer. And guess what? A lot of times processed food has tons of salt, tons of sodium. The sodium typically comes as sodium chloride. The chloride is a negatively charged ion, anion, and in the blood, all the anions have to always be balanced. So when you increase the chloride, you're gonna decrease the bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is a negatively charged ion, and so that's also a pH buffer. When you decrease the bicarbonate, then what's going to happen is you're gonna also get a low-grade metabolic acidosis. So what am I saying? Salted meat, is a major contributor to osteoporosis. So that chloride-induced low-grade metabolic acidosis is also going to be buffered by leaching calcium from the bones and then peeing it out through the kidneys coupled to excretion of hydrogen protons. So basically, increased salt consumption, increased meat consumption, they're all leading to worsening osteoporosis. Okay, uh, the other thing is being sedentary versus exercising. 
you want to keep moving as much as you can. In all the healthiest populations in the world, none of them goes to the health club every day. They exercise just by doing things, by farming, by trying to grow some food, uh, by foraging for food. And so you want to keep moving as much as you can. If you have to work at a desk job, try to get a standing desk. Um, try to get up every couple of minutes, not every couple of minutes, but every reasonable amount of time interval for whatever you do, every 30 minutes or something, and go walk to the bathroom. Walk to the farthest bathroom, okay? Create all kinds of little ways to get more exercise in your day. If you're at home, for example, go to the bathroom that's farthest away from you on another floor so you have to do some stairs. A lot of stairs are a great exercise to keep yourself healthy. Basically, people who keep moving, they stay a lot more physically fit. Um, people that are, you know, sit there sluggish, they get fat and stupid. They don't do well. Your, your body and your brain are a use it or lose it system. You have to keep using your physical abilities and your cognitive abilities. Otherwise, those neurons will atrophy. Those neuronal pathways will atrophy. And if excessively neglected, they'll atrophy till they're gone. And you might not be able to get them back. So anyways, try to increase all the green stuff here in your life. And you'll be healthier and happier. That's it.